Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew's Gospel, the 21st chapter, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants, they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent the other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone whom it falls upon will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew that he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of his word. Well, if you're tuning in today, you're already in the month of October. Can you believe that? It's October already. And if it's October, that means there's only a couple of months until Christmas. Can you believe that? So I thought today it'd be great to start with a Christmas story. There's a, a song that uh, is sung, not often, but some, during the Christmas season. It really started as a poem. It's by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And the name of the song is, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It was written by Longfellow. Longfellow was born in Portland, Maine in 1807. He grew up, 
he wrote, he studied, he became a professor, and for the most part, life was good for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, life treated him well. But as he got a little older, things took a, a turn. His first wife died from complications of a pregnancy. His second wife died when her dress caught on fire. In 1863, Longfellow's son was severely injured in the Civil War. News spread that, that he was hurt and he might not live. And so a month after this news in 1863, on Christmas Day, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow writes this poem that would become the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. That's incredible. A month after his son was injured, while Longfellow's still worrying and wondering what's going to become and happen to his son, he writes these words. The song struggles to help us understand uh, the battle that's raging in our country at that time, but it's also a metaphor for has to be the, the battle that's raging in Longfellow's soul and his heart uh, about his faith with God, the, the two parts, the good and the bad. One of the lines in I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day says this, hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Hate is strong and mocks the song. You know, that sounds like it could be written today, doesn't it? We see all around us this tension, this struggle, this battle. When is it going to end and what's going to break through? Well, the song progresses through this battle, this struggle about uh, what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, and how will this all end? And the refrain keeps hearing the Christmas bells. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and it, it sounds like those bells have a, an ability to sort of uh, help Longfellow come to a, a, a sort of a faith moment in his life. Uh, where he's struggling with the things that have happened in his life has to be some doubt and anger towards God, uh, has to be some doubt and anger about what's happened to his son. But he ends the song with these words, But then the bells, more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, and the right will prevail with peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Wow. <laughs> Longfellow has hope, but I don't know where he gets it from. He shouldn't be as gracious as he is. In the end for Longfellow, love wins, forgiveness wins. Uh, he comes back to a faith in God, even amidst all that he doesn't understand. So I guess my question today is with this passage and with this song, what would you do? What would you do? Could you have written a song like that after those events? And I know that some of you have, have dealt with really difficult times in your life. Uh, how do you do that? How do you maintain faith? Can you maintain faith? Could you have written a song like this? Could you have even thought like this? Could you, would you, be as gracious as this? You know, if, if someone broke the trust that you had put in them, if someone destroyed something that was precious to you, if, if someone cheated and lied in order to take something from you, what, what would you do? What would you do? Well, I, I'm guessing that you'd be mad if, if you have any human DNA in you. Uh, you. You'd be mad. You'd want revenge. You'd want retribution. You'd want justice. So it's really interesting now to go back to our story. 
Matthew is telling this story of God's amazing, over-the-top, gracious, incredible love. It's a, it's a story that Matthew is writing after the resurrection and death and resurrection of Jesus. He's looking back on what happened, the things that Jesus said, the parables that he told, the, the whole image and understanding of who he thought God was at one point in his life and who he's come to understand God to be at this point in his life. Matthew has been the recipient of this undeserved, over-the-top, gracious love, and he's, he's writing to tell us about it. He, he's writing with almost an uncontainable uh, eagerness to help us to see how amazing and how incredible God's love is, that it defies logic, that it defies uh, the, the human uh, way of doing things. And, and, and Matthew so desperately, like all the New Testament writers, want us to get it, uh, to understand, to see it, uh, to see it for ourselves, to accept it. This story in the 21st chapter of Matthew uh, is a, a, about this kind of love, this unrealistic, over-the-top, gracious God that doesn't do what we would do, but does something we could never imagine. I wonder if you're tuning in, watching this with somebody today, if you could turn to them and say, that's awesome. And if you're watching this alone, maybe you could get your phone and text somebody and say, God's love is awesome. In Matthew 21, the writer is saying that we shouldn't have hope or that, that God shouldn't have hope. And he goes through a list of things that, that has happened uh, to illustrate that. God shouldn't love us. God shouldn't care for us. We haven't earned it. And you know, uh, part of our understanding of God, misguided understanding, is that God's love is transactional. Uh, we do something and therefore God loves us. We do good, God rewards us by uh, taking care of us. And that's not how God's love works at all, but that's how humans understand love a lot of the time, that it's transactional. And so in this passage, we see uh, that, that, that God has every right to be angry. Uh, as you go back to the beginning of the chapter, Jesus cleanses the temple uh, because the tenants in the temple are doing bad stuff. In the next little scene, Jesus is cursing a fig tree because the fig tree isn't producing the fruit that it ought to. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not doing what it was designed and created to do. And Jesus walks by and curses it. The next little scene is, is people are challenging Jesus' authority uh, to speak about God. You don't know what you're talking about. Where did you come up with this? We're not going to listen to you. Uh, what do you know? Uh, who gave you the right to speak for God? And then we find these two parables. The first parable is about the two sons who don't want to work and make excuses. Um, and then the parable that we read today about the tenants who just lose their mind. They think the land is theirs. They take over. Uh, they don't have any interest in what the owner wants to do or say or think. Uh, they think it's their land and their stuff, and, and they don't want to listen to the Creator, uh, to God. Uh, if you go back through the passage, the, the story is talking about God uh, is the owner. The prophets are the servants that are killed, uh, and the tenants are uh, the chief priests and the religious leaders, but also people like you and me who kind of opt for greed instead of faith. And so the, the chapter ends with the religious leaders mad as they can be. They're so mad they can't see straight. Uh, they want to attack Jesus, but they're afraid of the crowd. Uh, they know that Jesus is talking about them, uh, and, and they don't like it. Sometimes the truth hurts. It's, it's not a great story, really. It's not the kind of news that you want to get. Uh, we, humans, don't get painted in a very great light in this story. It's the kind of thing, the kind of story almost that you'd expect in 2020, isn't it? But notice how it starts. 
It starts with the owner, again, God, plants the vineyard. God does the work. But not only that, he doesn't stop at just planting the vineyard. He, he puts a fence around it. Uh, he doesn't stop there. He digs the wine press. He builds the tower. Oh, my gosh. Uh, God does all the work. God provides this wonderful vineyard, this great space, provides all that infrastructure for the vineyard. Uh, the owner is incredible. The owner is great. The, the owner provides so much. Surely, the owner can't do any more than that. Surely, the grace of the owner uh, is capped out at that point. Surely, there's no more good the owner can do. So what do we do with this gracious gift? We kill the servants. Then when the owner sends his son, we kill him too. Uh, we think that we can steal the vineyard away from the owner. Uh, just think of the audacity of that. Uh, the craziness of that. So if you were the owner, again, what would you do? In fact, that's the question that Jesus asks in verse 40. He says, what would you do? If you were the owner, what would you do? What will the owner do? And the ex expectation is that surely the owner has had enough. This is the last straw. Oh gosh, all hell is about to break loose. But that's not what happens. Here's the thing. This is the thing that both endears us and frustrates us with God. God is a God of mercy and of holiness. God is a God of forgiveness and judgment. The God of John 3.16 is also the God of of revelations, the God of grace, and the God of law, a God of found and of lost, a God of joy and of sadness, a God of sun and of rain, a God of hope and despair, a God of the servants in this story, but also the God of the tenants. God of the folks who worked all day in the fields, and God of the ones who come in the last hour and get paid the same. God of the saints and God of the sinners. You know, when, when we hear stories like this, a lot of times our mind drifts off uh, to where we imagine who the villains around us are. And we all, we all have villains, uh, those folks, people who did that, people who say that, who, people who look that way, people who live there, people who have done that. We all have uh, saints and sinners that we point to. The reality is that we love mercy when the subject is us, don't we? We love to talk about mercy. We love to think about mercy. We love to contemplate and read passages about mercy, hear sermons about mercy when the subject is us. But when the subject is those folks and them and folks out there, we kind of lean into judgment. We like the stories of judgment when the subject is those folks and them, folks that are different from us. Folks that are out there somewhere. We don't want to think about the things we've done. We don't want to think about our sin. We don't want to think about what we're complacent in. We don't want to think about what we're complicit in. We want to minimize that. But we enjoy focusing, talking, uh, social uh, uh, responding about other people and their stuff. How can they live with themselves? How can they think that? How can they do that? What were they thinking? Weren't they raised any better than that? You know, that's why in the Bible we're not asked to be judges. We're not. 
I know that's disappointing to some of y'all, but we're not asked to be judges. Uh, and the reason is, is because we just don't have the right perspective. We're, we're all captive to the culture we're raised in and the, uh, the influences that have just happened in our lives. Uh, we're all uh, a part of uh, the, the environment that we're in. And so our, our lenses are a little cloudy. We can't be as open and as pure in our judgment as God can. So that's why judgment isn't something that we're asked to do. It's not our job. Our job is pretty simple, really. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Don't worry, Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye, but focus on the log that is clouding your vision. You know, we, we started the, this morning with a song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It's a great song with a, a great story. I'd like to share another song with you, the one that we'll sing at the end of the service today. It is Well With My Soul. It's a song by Horatio Spafford, and it's reported that it was written uh, as he was on a ship uh, across the Atlantic. On a previous ship th uh, that sank, uh, his children perished. They died. His wife survived, and she was waiting uh, in Europe for Horatio, who couldn't make the first trip. And, um, and, and, the, and the story is that near the spot where his children died, he writes this song, It is well with my soul. And there's so much that he could have focused on. He could have been angry. The, the, this, the emotion and the experience is still pretty new and pretty raw. He could have focused on how mean God was. Why would God do that? Why did God do that? His faith could have been shattered. It could have been a, a disaster. But he writes these words in the third verse. My sin, <laughs> oh, the glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, it is well with my soul. Wow. Now, there, there may be a lot of folks that, that are thinking, how could he write something like that at a time like that? Well, it, it kind of goes along, I think, with uh, Heard the Bells on Christmas Day and our scripture passage today. Um, God is a God of, of grace, and, and it's an amazing story of how God provides for us. It's, it's not what we do, but it's what God has done. It's not what we deserve. It's not a transaction, but it's God's grace, even in the midst of the pain of life. And so many of us right now are experiencing difficult times and pains and loss and, and uh, separation and, and things that we uh, wish were not the way they were. Many of us are, are frustrated by uh, decisions and, and uh, experiences in our land uh, and how to make those better, how to make those just. And so the temptation is to lash out and to scream and holler and to, to point the finger at those that are different than us. Well, you know, the first Sunday in October is celebrated all over the world in churches as World Communion Sunday. It's a Sunday where traditionally we've tried to recognize that uh, the Christian faith embodies people of all shapes and sizes, colors, nationalities, uh, and backgrounds. And the hope and the message is that we might be a light to the world of how to get along and how to work together and how to come together in good times and in bad. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So world communion is about getting what we need and not what we deserve. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have taken gifts and graces that God has given us and misused them. We all have a debt to pay that we have no ability or capital to pay it with. We don't improve our situation by pointing at somebody who's worse than us. At the end of the day, Jesus offers grace to the servants, but also to the tenants. At the end of the day, Jesus offers grace to the Jews and the Gentiles. Matthew wants us to know how earth-shattering that is, how gracious that is, how over-the-top, how amazing that kind of grace really is. And it is incredible because it's not our grace. We don't own it. We don't dispense it. We don't manage it. We don't have veto power over who gets it and who doesn't. We are simply offered this gift of grace. I hope that today, on World Communion Sunday, that you will receive this incredible offer of grace. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. Let us pray. Amazing and gracious God, we, we, we don't even know where to start. Uh, we have mistreated you, we have mistreated each other, we have mistreated your son, we have mistreated your spirit, we have mistreated the gifts that you have given us, and still your offer of grace is on the table. God, it seems that if you were human, you would have long since just given up on us but your offer of grace still extends. We grieve at the condition of some of the things that are going on in our world today. The hatred, the anger, the bitterness, the, the vile exchanges that we hear and that we see. And we, we come to you, God, on this World Communion Sunday to, to ask your forgiveness and to ask your help as we lean into your grace, not trying to take it from somebody else, not trying to determine if they're worthy or not, but simply to receive the grace that you offer and to live in love and charity with those around us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.